On the first genetics review video, we talked about Mendel as the father of modern genetics or understanding of biology in terms of genes as factors that determine the heredity or the patterns of how traits are passed on from generation to generation. And we talked about his use of pea plants to actually solve a problem that he saw with flowers and that it took him years to actually get to the solution. And we hinted at the solution, which was basically that there are two different ways of looking dominant. That traits have dominance relationships, that they do not blend, and that the genes segregate and, and actually recombine with those different dominance relationships to make the looks that we actually are. Let's review these things and also talk, do a little bit about advanced genetics in this second part of the genetics review video. So, Mendel started with the P generation, true breeders, and at the end of last video we talked about how he actually got to those true breeders and how he actually made sure that he was crossing what he wanted to cross, how he actually controlled that. And he got these true breeders, crossed them with themselves to make the F1 generation that was always hybrids. And then notice that this teaches him this first lesson that there is no such thing as blending, that particle genetics is actually what dominates here, that traits want dominates over the other whenever they two collide. And that's the idea of particle genetics. And it's actually better that way because if blending was the case, after a few generations, everybody would essentially look the same. And that would be disastrous for life because diversity protects us from disease and makes us more resilient to the environment. If the environment changes, it's likely that at least one of us will survive if we're all different from each other. But if the environment is changes and we're all the same, chances are that if one of us dies, all of us will die and so particle genetics has an advantage over the whole blending idea because of that unless of course you want everybody to look the same in that case go with blending but either way the law of dominance is figured out at that point then he gets the F1 generation and cross it with itself to in the F1 cross to get the F2 generation where three out of the four look dominant and one looks recessive but hold on a second the recessive look comes back out of nowhere which teaches him his second lesson that genes do not blend, but actually segregate, separate, and then recombine to form looks that seem to have disappeared. Confirming his idea of particle genetics, that things do not blend. This F1 cross is the best cross to show the law of segregation, which, by the way, is tied into the idea of meiosis, doing the meiosis 1, anaphase 1, independent of assortment of homologs, explains how these genes are actually separating into different gametes, and therefore creating this separation of the particles, which can then recombine with the particles of another parent to form new looks, depending on the specific dominance relationships. So what Mendel figures out then, at that point, is that there's two different ways of looking dominant. He also figures out that if you are homozygous dominant, you have two of the same version of the same of, of the gene. Each trait is determined by a factor. He called them factors at that time. Now we call them genes. But the traits have different versions of, for these genes. If you have two of the same, you're homozygous or true breeder. And if you have different versions, you are called heterozygous or a hybrid. But the homozygous dominant and the hybrid or heterozygous look the same. So there's two different ways of looking dominant and only one way of looking recessive, which is if you have two paired recessive alleles or if you have only one, which happens sometimes. We're going to talk about that when we do chromosomal inheritance. And so he discovers that it's the combination of one allele, which now we understand is present in one chromosome, and another allele, which now understand is present in its homolog pair, will actually determine the way we look like. In this case, for example, if you have a purple allele and a white allele, you're going to be heterozygous and therefore look purple. This idea of inheritance is a novel idea that revolutionizes our study and understanding of biology. He then proceeded to do the F2 cross, where he got the children of the F1 cross, or the F2 generation, and crossed them with themselves. And we talked about in the last video how you can use this cross, especially the F2 test cross, to determine the unknown genotype of a phenotype that looks dominant. You can also do a, a self-cross, but not everything can self-cross because not everything has both genders in it or can cross with itself. And therefore, you need test crosses whenever you don't have genetic analysis devices or the ability to do self-pollination like the pea flowers can do. Now, notice, by the way, that the F2 dominance cross is indistinguishable from the true breeder cross where you have the homozygous dominance crossing with it themselves because everybody in that cross was going to look dominant regardless. Also notice an inter interesting fact about the F2 
two crosses is that the ratios, the genotype ratios and phenotype ratios of the parents match the phenotype ratios and genotype ratios of the children. Nowadays, we actually use Punnett squares to determine the probabilities of these events of, of Mendel's crosses because of a scientist called Punnett actually came up with a system to code uh, the explanation for the genetic crosses that we're talking about. And it all has to do with creating alleles and separating them in the formation, during the formation of gametes, which we now understand has everything to do, again, with meiosis 1 and separation of homologs. And so, Punnett squares can help us determine the probability of events. For example, whenever two hybrids collide, there's only a 25% chance of having a child that has the recessive trait. So, for example, if two children of albino parents, in other words, one parent was albino, the other one wasn't. That means if you had a parent that was albino, you absolutely have an albino gene. Why? Because albinism is a recessive trait. If you had an albino parent, you definitely carry the albino trait. So if you get a child that has a, a, a parent that has albinism and a parent that doesn't, it's a homozygous dominant, no albinism gene, this children is going to be a heterozygous. If you get a child like that and cross with another child like that, chances are he's going to have a 1 in 4 chances of having an albino child, which wouldn't be really a problem anyway since people can live with albinism. But you see how you can use Punnett squares to actually figure out the chances of any particular trait showing up, and you see the same cross patterns that we talked about before represented in these aspects of Punnett squares. Now, what we have to talk about is the idea of incomplete dominance or co-dominance. Some traits do not obey Mendel's idea of what happens with the pea plants. Because, for example, when you have a red rose and a white rose and you combine them with each other and you're supposed to get all the roses looking like the dominant trait, which is the red, you don't get that. Instead, you have a mixture look, kind of like you know, the blending theory would suggest. Well, the genes are still not blended. You still have a big A and a little A separate from each other. But what's happening there is that the traits are speaking just as loudly as each other. And therefore, you're going to have a blended look or a pink flower come out of that. And then if you've got that generation across with itself, you're going to have one red, two pink, and one white on the cross. So you see that the kind of dominance alters the phenotype ratio of the F1 cross. The genotype ratio won't be affected. You're still going to get one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. The difference is that the heterozygous will no longer look dominant. It will look like a blended look. And then you have co-dominance. And that's the weird thing when you have flowers which have both colors in them, like a red flower and a white flower all in one. Or when you have two different color eyes and some kinds of dogs, for example. That kind of thing happens when both genes speak at the same time. And therefore, instead of getting a blended look like you're getting incomplete dominance, you get a flower that has red and white in the same flower. So both incomplete dominance and co-dominance will affect the phenotype ratios of any cross where the uh, hybrid is part of it, which means, for example, doing the F2 test cross, well, it won't be half dominant, half recessive, it will be half blended, half recessive, or half co-dominant, half recessive. So they see that the patterns of these crosses will be affected by the kind of dominance relationship that exists. And, what, and how do you determine which kind of dominance relationship exists? It's basically on the chemistry between the two different alleles. Sometimes one alley overpowers the other and you have complete dominance. Sometimes one alley speaks just as loudly as the other and you have incomplete dominance. And sometimes alleles speak at the same time and you have co-dominance. By the way, who says a pink flower is actually incomplete dominance or that is actually a blended look? If you look carefully inside the flower, you might actually realize that the reason why it looks pink is because it's making red and white pigment at the same time. And when you look at the flower from far away, it will make it look like it's pink. But molecularly, it's actually cold dominance. They're actually making both at the same time, which raises the question. Is incomplete dominance or co-dominance when you look at something? Well, it depends on how close you look at it. Now we're getting to the ideas of advanced genetics. Another concept that has to do with advanced genetics is the idea that genes can sometimes react with each other. For example, whenever you have one gene that depends on another, you have something that's called epistasis. For example, if you have gene A, which determines whether or not gene B does its job, which then determines the look. For the best example of this is albinism. You may have a lot of genes telling you to be black, but if you don't know how to make color, you're going to be albino. So in other words, gene B will tell you how much color to make. So you're born from two black parents, you're going to be very black. But if your 
have a problem with the gene that tells you how to make color, you're not going to be black at all. You're going to be albino. And so, albinism is a perfect example of epistasis. You also have the idea of platropy, which is when one gene has many jobs. So, for example, gene A will create several different looks. For example, when the same gene that causes cells to divide and to grow is also related to cancer. So this gene has many jobs in the body. Another type of advanced genetic relationship is the idea of multifactorial traits or polygenic inheritance. And that's when you have a trait or a character which is not determined by one gene but by many genes. And so that look will actually depend on the combination of many genes put together. When that happens, you instead of having something that looks one way or the other, or having a discrete look, you're going to have several looks with everything in between. For example, skin color is a great example of this. It's actually many genes that help determine your skin color. And that's why you, for one gene, you might say make a little more color, another gene might say make a little more color. It says the additive factor of all these genes put together that actually make the color you end up being which is why there's so many different kinds of skin color in the human race. And then you also have epigenetics, which is the idea that sometimes genes interact with the environment to actually make the look. For example, how intelligent you are, homosexualism, height, color of the skin, remember Tanny, all of these things are examples of things which will determine, depend both on genetics and on the environment. A combination of what the environment you learn or what the environment does to you and the genes that you were born with will actually help determine the way you turn out. And so these genetic relationships will explain a lot of things. For example, if we change one thing in the human genome and many things changes at once, it's probably the result of platropy or one gene with many jobs or perhaps epistasis because sometimes one gene is dependent on other genes. If you have two brothers that have exactly the same gene and yet they look different from each other, what could explain that? Well, epigenetics. Maybe the environment they were raised in made them look different. Maybe it's epistasis. Even if they have the same gene B, if they have a different gene A upon which gene B depends, that would explain why they look different. Also, it could be multifactorial traits because even if they have the same gene A, if they have genes B, gene C, gene D, which is are different and all of these genes collaborate to create the look just because they have the same gene A it's not gonna mean they're gonna have the same look and see how you can put all of these different things together to understand how genetics actually works which is why for example you shouldn't change genes without being careful because even if you change a gene it might not make a difference because of multifactorial traits you might change one gene but there's many others which are making the same thing happen and so it won't matter also, the environment might still cause the look even if you do change the genes. And then, if you change the gene but to cause a certain thing to happen, you might cause other problems because that gene could have multiple jobs or could affect other genes. Which is why, for example, we can't just go around and knock genes out. For example, it sounds appealing to remove the cancer gene. But if you remove the cancer gene, it might not actually make a difference because the environment could cause cancers or other genes could also cause the cancer. And that cancer gene could also be involved in other jobs in the body. And it could affect other genes as well. And so when you change that, you could cause it a lot of other problems. And see, genetics is a lot more complicated than you think. And that's why different people react in different ways to the same environment. Because we have different genes. And how do you figure out if a trait is actually environmental or if it's going to be genetic? Well, if you have two twins, twins that look exactly the same, and you go ahead and put them in different env environments, First, ten, first twin in one environment and the other twin is raised in a different environment. Say, for example, two identical twins which are raised apart, whatever differences exist between them must be environmental. On the other hand, if you get two fraternal twins which are different from each other and you put them in the same environment, or in other words, twins born at the same time, any difference between them must be because of the genes that they do not share because they're only going to be 50% the same. And that means that using twin studies, you can actually figure out whatever is environmental and whatever is genetic. By the way, it's kind of impossible to create the same environment for two fraternal twins because from the moment of conception, they're going to be implanted in different areas and no parents could possibly treat the kids exactly the same way. Finally, if this wasn't hard enough, for some traits, there are multiple alleles. In Mendel's P's, there was only one or the other. So there's only two alleles. But in some traits, for example, like the human blood types or human eye color, there are multiple versions of the same gene because there's been multiple mutations of the same gene and therefore it gets even more complicated but remember that we are diploid so even if there are multiple versions of the genes we can only have 
two genes at the same time. And therefore, we're only going to have two out of the many that are possible out there. But as you can see, genetics can be a lot comp more complicated than what you think at face value.